Good evening, folks. How's everybody doing? Good? Well, first off, I want to thank you for joining us for a session this late in the day. I know everybody is ready for their evening beers uh, right after this, but we'll promise you there's good content here and there's nothing boring that you'll get out of the session. So, uh, true to our name, we'll start off with a story around chaos. So, I have, I'm here with some uh, crew members from T Mobile. Um, and uh, before I get started with my story and the actual content, how many of you have actually not been on an airplane? Okay, it's good. I was expecting that. Um, who's been with Alaska Airlines? Okay, couple. Who knows about chaos engineering? Okay, well, that's great. So you may be wondering what the hell is the connection between all this, right? But there's a story to it. So uh, we, uh, this crew that I'm talking about, started with Alaska Airlines on Monday from Seattle. So we're based off in Seattle. And uh, we checked in. I had my baggage checked in, hand, lu hand, hand luggage, which I should have just carried on with me, but I figured I'll just check it in. Showed up at the gate, and they were looking for some volunteers. Alaska Airlines, by the way, is huge in Seattle, um, if you didn't know that, right? And I, I was in the East Coast in Fort Lauderdale. I never heard about Alaska Airlines up until I went to Seattle. And little did I realize that they're huge there. Um, so we checked in. At the gate, they were looking for volunteers who could take a later flight. And in exchange, this was April 1st, in exchange, the deal was you'd get $750 per person. And we're like, this crew, right? Yeah, we're, we're, there's nothing we're going to do on day one. We can offer the stopover. Let's just, it's, it's too good of a deal. The hourly rate just was mind blowing. We're like, yeah, we're going to take this deal. So three of us decided to take the deal. Karuna and I did, um, you know, got the coupon, a handwritten voucher, and our flights had a stopover in uh, Detroit, Michigan. And then we end up, ended up coming into Seattle, uh, into uh, Philadelphia by 8 o'clock. And then another member came through Raleigh. So what happened is, little did I know that that was the start of some chaotic events. Uh, after I landed into Philadelphia, my luggage made it into Philadelphia. And it was in this Alaska office locked up. And I could see it from outside. Okay. So then there was numbers. There, we tried to go to different booths. Nobody was there. And little did I know that Alaska Airlines only has three flights out of Philadelphia every day. One, two in the morning and one at six o'clock in the evening. So the last flight was done for the day. So these guys are checked out and they're home. So you reach their customer service, terrible customer service, by the way. So I have to take that to Twitter. Okay. So anyways, so I was done for the day and I was ready for drinks, food. So we came in. I had... Uh, just my laptop, so you can imagine what I went through for that night, right? And uh, I had to wake up early in the morning, but this time around, on Tuesday morning, I decided to validate some of my assumptions. And what I did there was I called their customer service number again to validate if these guys are actually working or they're just checked out, right? So the central number happens to be a number in Philadelphia, and I called them, and then they warned me, like, hey, we have two shifts. The first shift is done at 8 o'clock, so if you don't make it by 8 o'clock, you can't pick up your luggage up until 2 o'clock. So I made it by 8 o'clock, got my luggage, thought everything was cool. And then for some reason, you know, naturally the $750, that was the big cut for me, right? So I was like, I couldn't validate it online. I couldn't get it checked online. And then I called the customer service again, and they tell me that, oh yeah, the person that handed the voucher forgot to do an extra step of validation. And I'm like, WTF, right? So as of now, the coupon is not validated. So I'm still like dealing with the pains of the chaos. So you may be wondering, what's the story and the connection here, right? It's, the connection here is the ripple effects that one event can have in your life leading to poor customer experience. That's exactly what chaos engineering deals with, which is expensive customer-facing outages. And how do you avoid it before your customers realize it? In this case, the customer was me. Yeah. Um, so without further delay, we'll get started. That's our first story for the day. So I'm Ramesh. I'm a senior manager for the platform engineering team at T-Mobile. Karun's uh, one of our brilliant engineers on the team, so he's here with us. He's got some live demos, by the way. We don't do recorded demos. We'd like to do live demos. So, uh, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, anyway, so without any further delays, I already mentioned my team's name. We're, plat we're called as, fondly called as the platform engineering team. And uh, behind the scenes, my team runs the container strategy for T-Mobile. So if you look at the evolution of infrastructure, you know. Everything is as a service model today, starting off with infrastructure, containers, platforms, and functions. So you name it, we have services and capabilities in each of these stacks, and we're growing fast into the top level stack, which is function as a service. 
So my group's um, you know, prime objective is to like, deliver modern, simple, secure, scalable services that are platform and infrastructure agnostic. We actually want to plug our platform capabilities that we built agnostic to any infrastructure. So behind the scenes, application workloads can don't know where the, their workloads are. That's the vision that we have in mind when we deliver on these platform capabilities. If you didn't know, the higher up you go on the stack, the more flexibility you get, less conformance to standards if you stay lower on the stack. So every application workload is unique. So at T-Mobile, we're trying to expose these different capabilities from a platform perspective so that our application teams will rightfully choose what and where they want to run their workloads at. So speaking of Cloud Foundry, um, I see a couple of phases that may have been in the previous session around how big is too big. Um, if you didn't know, we are actually one of the world's largest Cloud Foundry installation by all means. Uh, some which we're very proud of, some which we're not, and I'll get to those. Um, we have 13 plus foundations. The 36,000 containers is outdated. As of last night, it's 39,000 containers. 700 million daily transactions, right? And 3,000 plus business critical applications, 100 plus project teams. So that's the scale at which we're running. And behind the scenes, my team is around 25, including my leadership group and my product manager. So, um, but this group is not all doing PCF. We also have another platform to manage, which is PKS, right? So behind the scenes, we have four different domains trying to deliver this customer experience, doing bigger things around platform intelligence, and then focusing on some of the core stuff that we need to deliver for PCF and PKS. So PCF is all about agility redefined. I won't sell too much on marketing here for Cloud Foundry. You guys know what, what this is about, right? So for us, it's all about developer agility, faster apps, more frequent changes. In fact, one of the numbers I have from uh, our peer teams here is 1,000 changes. Uh, daytime changes that have gone through in fiscal year 2018, fewer incidents, zero downtime deployments. So all of these radical culture shift changes at T-Mobile, um, really embracing the DevOps buzzword. It's no longer a buzzword where we truly believe that you write a piece of code, you own it when it's deployed to production. Who knows what this is? Minus the team of folks. Death Star. Who was that? Awesome, thank you. Do you know whose Death Star that is? Yours. Well, I wish, but uh, okay. Okay, who do you think this is? Good. Who do you think that is? That is T-Mobile. Um, so yeah, so this is what I call the explosion of microservices, right? Containers is everywhere. This uh, trend towards you know service model comes with a cost, which is people write these microservices not knowing what kind of ecosystem that these microservices live in, right? And that's the kind of ecosystem. Keep in mind that um, I used to be with Amazon at some point. So it's, this is, I think, a snapshot from year 2009. So it's pretty old. And you can only imagine with the growth that they have had what this could look like today. The guy that wrote this tool, I don't think he cared to refresh. He's like, this is just too much work for me to refresh, right? But we are, we're fascinated to see our growth with containers and uh, the whole evolution towards microservices and this explosion. Um, so for us, it's all about like what could go wrong when your services get released to this wild atmosphere where it's a shared ecosystem, but you need to know how to cope up with failures, right? So for us, the only thing that is constant is not change anymore. It's failures. We want to embrace it because failure is inevitable. So this is not a line from the Final Destination movie. This is my own. Uh, if you've seen Final Destination, they talk about death is inevitable right now. That's not this. This is our own version of chaos engineering and what we think about failures. Okay. Um, so go, going to the problem statement, today's talk is around chaos engineering for Cloud Foundry. We spoke about developer productivity. We spoke about customer obsession. You know, you want to like have your developers build, deploy rapidly, operate these services uh, in the cloud. But at the same time, you want to focus on delightful customer experience. All it takes is this one chaotic event, just like I explained with the Alaska event that happened to me, to break my trust with them, which today it's gone, right? So they need to get it back from me, and they have to work on it. So the same, the same thing happens with service ecosystem. We are a customer-driven team. Our job is to deliver capabilities to our customer. And if we break that trust, it's going to be an expensive trust break that we have to fix. So what if there is real chaos? And that's the problem statement. That said. Yep. So uh, before I give you the actual solution design, let's begin with another story here. Can I get the point, please? Yeah. 
Once there lived a king. He received a gift of two magnificent falcons. They were so adorable that king gave it to head falconer to train them. Months passed. The falcon trainer trained them for two months or three months and months passed. One of the falcons was flying, but the other remained on the branch. King got so upset. He got so depressed. He called up all the wise men in his kingdom, but no one could make the bird fly. But after a few days, the day when the king came out, he saw the second fa falcon flying too. King immediately calls his minister and asks him, who is the doer, doer of this miracle? Minister, it's a local farmer who solved this problem. The king with the farmer, how could you do it when all the wise men couldn't do it? The farmer says, it was very easy, your highness. I simply cut the branch where the bird was flying, where the bird was sitting. So the moral of the story is, the simple change made the bird fly. The simple change can disrupt our systems. Not all problems need a complex solution. So with all the complex systems, with all the distributed environment we have, are we prepared for chaos? What do you think about the app resiliency? Yeah, rightly said. You know, uh, like it says on the slide, right? Our confirmation to the familiar, comfortable, and mundane, that's our usual comfort zone. But for you to get out of your comfort zone, you need to learn to destroy the branch of these network connections and uh, free yourself from the glory of app resiliency. If you want to build better applications, you've got to break your applications. Great. So let me reiterate the problem statement. Before that, uh, we need to understand the definition of chaos engineering. It's basically a discipline of experimenting on a distributed system in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in the production. So that's what is principle of chaos engineering from Netflix definition is. So let me reiterate the problem statement. So like uh, at T-Mobile, we started looking at uh, the chaos engineering problem in two different ways. One, infrastructure level chaos attack. The other one is application level chaos attack. So T-Mobile is not a single application company. We have 3,000 plus applications belonging to multiple internal customers running on a shared foundation. So performing a chaos attack at the infrastructure level is definitely going to create customer impact at different levels, right? So, so uh, and as Ramesh said, how customer obsessed we are, we, we came out with another concept called application level chaos attack, wherein we can perform a single targeted attack on a particular application or its dependency without affecting any other application running on the same Diego cell or on the foundation. So we use two open source solutions here, like you know, Turbulence++ plus plus is a wrapper around another open source, open source solution called Turbulence, whereas Monarch is our own uh, uh, internal toolkit that we have started open sourcing it, and uh, it is responsible for performing application level chaos attacks. <coughs> so in our journey for uh, finding out the existing solutions, uh, we didn't want it to reinvent the wheel. So our journey started this way. So we started with Chaos Lemur. Uh, but you can see the feature functions, like you know, some of the functions that we have picked up here are only finite few, uh, just to give you a brief understanding of how the comparison goes between the different solutions that exist in the market today. So Chaos Lemur can only perform killing of the VMs, but we also wanted to perform killing of a random process, killing of uh, introducing a latency, introducing CPU memory hog, and application knowledge as well. So Chaos Lemur was falling short in this. So we also evaluated another commercial offering called Gremlin. Uh, it uh, later uh, point of time, they also added uh, uh, application knowledge uh, to their toolkit, so which was good. And then, uh, but we were still constantly hunting for a solution in the open source space. So that's when we came across Turbulence. The Turbulence, as I said, is uh, is a chaos engineering toolkit at the infrastructure level. It can perform killing of virtual machines, killing of a process, introducing latencies, and introducing CPU and memory hogs. But it, can, it doesn't know where your application is running in your cluster. So that's where uh, the T-Mobile's CTK comes in, which has got all the check marks. And uh, the CTK of T-Mobile is a combination of both Monarch and Turbulence++. So introducing Monarch and Turbulence++. Both these solutions enables initiating sophisticated failure injection tests on any BOSS deployed infrastructure. So it could be PCF or it could be a Kubernetes uh, that is managed by the Bosch. And apps deployed in such infrastructure can also go through you know, a sophisticated chaos engineering attacks. 
Now let's uh, look at the high level features that we offer as a part of Turbulence Plus Plus today. So the Turbulence as such is both an API server and an agent. So the agent gets deployed in each of the virtual machines of the Cloud Foundry. Now the features that are in, uh, you know, uh, highlighted here are the offerings that we have added on the top of open source solution Turbulence. So killing VM, killing a process, pausing a process, introducing some stress, corrupting the disk, limiting the bandwidth, reordering of the packets, targeted blocking, and blocking DNS and duplication of the packets. So these are some of the features that we have added to Turbulence Plus Plus. We are going to look at some demo and uh, uh, you know, get a feel of uh, the functionality as well. Whereas from the Monarch, which is an application level chaos attack, it can, it can identify, it can discover where your application is running inside the cluster of multiple virtual machines. It can block the traffic ingress or egress to the application. It can also introduce latency at the service level. So let's say if there is a service to service communication that is happening and you have programmed a timeout mechanism, what happens if your dependent service uh, you know, uh, throws out some latency? How is your uh, service one is going to act, right? So those kind of scenarios can be simulated through Monarch and bandwidth restriction uh, and crashing a random AIs. We'll look at some demos, uh, you know, each explaining some of the functionalities as well. So, infrastructure level chaos engineering. <coughs> So uh, Cloud Foundry is a collection of multiple virtual machines. So imagine a scenario uh, where there is a process called rep that is re responsible for managing the entire life cycle of the containers running on that Diego, sorry, Diego cell is killed. What happens if a virtual machine goes down, right? So what happens to the application instances or the containers running in that Diego cell? And Cloud Foundry is based on timeout mechanism. What happens if there's a latency introduced between Go router and the Diego cell? So all these kind of simulations can be performed with Turbulence++ plus plus today. So you can, given a Cloud Foundry cluster, you can go and choose which particular virtual machine or which random virtual machine you wanted to kill. or you can also kill a particular process running inside the Diego cell. And what happens, how would the Cloud Foundry cluster behave in, in, in the process of, uh, you know, when, when the process gets killed, right? And what happens if, the, if a, a fake latency is introduced between Go Router and a couple of other virtual machines? So the Turbulence++ Plus Plus is a solution for this. And uh, we have, uh, uh, it's all written in Go. And, uh, you know, we have a demo for showing these three capabilities. Can we look into the demo? Yeah, let's go. So uh, for this demo, uh, we are going to look at uh, using Turbulence++, plus plus, how are we going to kill virtual machine? How are we going to block SSH traffic to the Diego cell? And how can we manipulate network traffic? So for this demo, I have uh, used Bosch Lite environment, but uh, it can very well be uh, replicated on any uh, Cloud Foundry or Pivotal Cloud Foundry clusters. Is the font visible? Check. Okay, cool. Thanks. So this is uh, the Bosch uh, Bosch Lite running on my uh, laptop, and uh, so Bosch. I have already logged into it, and these are the deployments that I've got. I have uh, CF deployment, and I've got Turbulence. So let's look at what Turbulence Bosch add-on. Uh, this is the Bosch add-on that we have added, and. Uh, Turbulence. Let's list the VMs that are there in Turbulence. So there is an API server that is uh, running. So it's a very simple, uh, and we have not made much change for this demo. It's uh, already part of open source Turbulence solution. So the API server is running, and it's listening on this IP address. And let's look at the virtual machines of CF. So you can see uh, uh, we have a bunch of virtual machines in the Bosch Lite Cloud Foundry uh, deployment. You have adapter, you have API server, uh, worker, console, database, Diego, Diego API, and Diego cell. So we have only one Diego cell here. So as I said earlier, as, we, as you all might be knowing, Diego cell is the one which hosts application instances in it or the containers running in it you know, are deployed in the Diego cell. And right now for this Bosch Lite environment, I have only one Diego cell. 
So uh, I'm going to uh, use uh, Chaos Toolkit, which is a driver for uh, which has a driver for turbulence to initiate a pause process. So what does it mean? So let's uh, see. Let's do an SSH into the Dago cell. So what you do is uh, you just uh, select the, uh, the, the target to the uh, actual deployment, do an SSH and the Dago cell. As you can see, you are inside the shell of uh, the Dago cell and it's very pretty responsive now, right? So let me exit from here. And I'm gonna repeat the same step when I do the chaos attack, during and after. <laughs> so uh, Chaos Toolkit Turbulence is all open sourced as well. So uh, when you go in here, we run a bunch of Python scripts for running these experiments. So first attack that I'm going to do is uh, Okay, before that, let me uh, give you a very uh, quick insight into the JSON, uh, the JSON, the, the actual Chaos Toolkit JSON itself. So this is a Chaos Toolkit uh, JSON object. Uh, it basically uh, has a standard title, description, what kind of attack that you're trying to perform. And what we are doing is impacting or pausing an SSHD access to a random Diego cell. Uh, there is a steady state hypothesis. It is empty for now. Uh, but the most important thing is the method that you're performing. The action that you're doing is uh, 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 attacking and pausing a process uh, with the process name SSHD on a deployment CF uh, for a Diego cell and select any ID for this, limit to one. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to run this experiment, pause process. And before I run this, um, let's let's check if uh, the SSH connection is fine, and it's pretty responsive again, right? So let's go back and initiate the attack. So it's running the experiment, uh, and uh, and it's trying to uh, run it. So let's try and see if we can do an SSH now. All right, still. live demos. Okay, cool. It's not working. Anyways, so uh, let's move on to the second demo and uh, let's see if we can uh, perform uh, uh, network, uh, you know, uh, latency there. That's the challenge with live demos, but <laughs> hang tight, guys. Yes, somebody is running attack on us. That's the challenge here. I don't know who it is. Please, if you're doing something, stop. So we have uh, uh, the ping operation happening on the Diego cell, and uh, you can see uh, the time is uh, less than you know uh, one second here. It's a couple of zero zero point zero six zero milliseconds, right? So let's. Um, Try to inject some. I think I'm connected on the internet. That's the reason VPN. So that's the. Goal. Should you disconnect from the VPN? Yeah. So now I think it should be okay. Yeah. So I was on the VPN. So it was uh, uh, 
playing with my network, internal network, so on the Bosch light. So let's uh, let's start the experiment again. Yeah, no, we'll start with the POS yeah. process. So we're going back to the POS process, the original first part of the demo, because we want our demos to be successful. Okay, let me exit now. Let's start with uh, the boss process. So uh, the steady state hypothesis and uh, um, so the, in the attack has been initiated. So let's try and do the uh, SSH connector connectivity now. So as you can see, there is a there is a brief pause um, because we have uh, paused the SSH connection for about 60 seconds, and that you can see it in the chaos toolkit uh, uh, timeout here. Uh, it's in the, in, the, in the file here, you have a timeout of one minute. So after 60 seconds, this lock on the SSH connectivity onto the DGO cell will be automatically released. So for now, uh, uh, for about 60 seconds, like you know, the SSH connectivity to the Bosch, uh, to, to this particular VM will be lost. And uh, you can simulate this experiment on any other process as well, like you know, rep process. What happens if you're pausing the rep process or killing the rep process for about 60 seconds? What happens to the application instances running on that Digo cell? So Does it automatically roll back after 60 yeah, seconds? It, uh, it, yeah, it got released, see, after 60 seconds. So now I'm going to exit again, and I'm going to try, because now I have not con uh, run any experiment now. Uh, I should be able to do an SSH connection without any issue. So that's pretty responsive now, right? So that's our first uh, uh, failure attack on a Bosch by killing a process. Now let's move on to the other attack, which I said is manipulating the traffic uh, inside the Digo cell. So for that, I have got another experiment, um, which is defined here as network attack JSON uh, file. It has got title, description, the standard uh, definition uh, structure of Chaos Toolkit. The method that we are going to do is uh, network attack Digo cell. The action that we are going to perform is uh, um, uh, attack control net. We tell the packet loss of 10%. And this is going to time out after one minute with a delay of 100 milliseconds. So we are injecting a 100 millisecond delay in when you are doing a ping operation onto the Digo cell. So let's run that. Again, we follow the same thing, Python hyphen M chaos toolkit, run the experiment and uh, network attack JSON. So the attack has uh, started. Now let's look at the virtual machines list. and get the IP address of Digo cell. So you can see the time uh, factor here. Mm -hmm. There is a time of uh, 100 milliseconds, approximately 100 milliseconds. There is always a standard deviation of 10% here and there, uh, which you can see like uh, it's taking uh, about 100 milliseconds to come back. And we also spoke about introducing a 5% packet loss. So uh, if we keep this ping operation running, uh, the ICMP traffic, it's the, you will find at one point within that one minute uh, some of the packets are deliberately lost so uh, the, the t turbulence agent which is deployed inside the uh, Digo cell is going to play a role there in dropping some of the pack packets so as you can see there's uh, two warnings here and there's a packet loss so so we have kept this attack for about 60 seconds again. So that's the reason uh, you see, and, and then we have also said like you know 5% of the packet loss. So again, if you come back and see here, the time is back to the normal, um, it was 100 milliseconds around, and then there's a quick transition. So the attack was there for about 60 seconds, and 
there are again n number of combinations you can keep trying this like you know you can inject some latency deliberately into one of the dego cells it can be 100 milliseconds or it can be even more than that and see how your cluster behaves that's that's one way of uh, you know checking the attacks now uh, let's uh, perform the third attack killing the virtual machine itself like uh, what happens if the diego cell goes down what happens to the application instances running in that particular virtual machine so i'm going to kill this uh, diego cell running in the bosch light So there's a kill Diego cell uh, JSON object. It's again a standard chaos toolkit structure that I've got here. So the action, uh, we have terminate Diego cell and the attack function is to kill any random Diego cell, uh, limiting it to one Diego cell for now. So you can limit to, if you have five Diego cells running in your cluster or 100 Diego cells, you can limit to any number for that. For now, since I have got only one Diego cell, I'm going to kill that Diego cell. So it got killed, the experiment ran now. <coughs> so I'm, when I list the virtual machines, you can see that the Diego cell is missing here. So there's Diego API, but, and then the Docker, there's no Diego cell. So now, uh, since it's deployed on, uh, so if you can see in the previous case, you had API server and the Diego cell was right beneath it. So the Diego cell has been killed by our Turbulence++ experiment. Now the Bosch, uh, the nature of the Bosch is uh, it has a self-healing and self-resiliency in inbuilt capability. So it is going to bring up a new Diego cell after a couple of minutes. So this is uh, what, uh, you know, in brief, how Turbulence++ works. And there are more, exp more, more, more functionalities that have, we have added and uh, more experiments that you can perform. Let's uh, move on to the application level uh, chaos engineering. Now, uh, like I said earlier, um, the application level chaos engineering enables one to perform a very targeted attack on an application running inside a cluster. So let's say I have an application instance, a, a droplet a container that is deployed inside the Diego cell here. So now, uh, this app, uh, this container, this app is dependent on MySQL database. It could be a shared service as well. Now, in this case, what happens if the traffic between the application instance or the container to the MySQL database is blocked? How would your application behave? What happens if there is a UI front-ending this microservice, and if you're crashing that microservice, how would the UI behave? And again, what if there's a latency introduced between your container and the MySQL database? All these three simulations can be performed with open source, again, a monarch. So there are a number of, uh, uh, again, uh, combinations that you can think of. What happens if there are multiple applications sh using the same shared MySQL database? You can go and then do a specific targeted block traffic attack for a particular application in that case without impacting any other applications running within the same Diego cell or inside the cluster. So that is what is the application level chaos engineering really mean. <coughs> Let me ask you a question there, Karun. Yeah. So Turbulence is focused on infrastructure. I just want to make sure folks understand that that Monarch is our newest capability focused on application level, right? Yes. So there's failures at two levels yes. that you're targeting yeah so uh, usually uh, as I said T-Mobile is not a single application company we have multiple uh, customers using our foundation so if I go ahead and perform a chaos attack on the infrastructure I have to get an approval from you know many other customers mm -hmm. right so that's not something that I wanted to do so rather how about simulating those failures at the application belonging to a particular customer so that's what is app, app level chaos engineering so uh, you might be familiar with this there's a concept called uh, uh, the butterfly effect. Yes. Do you know what is butterfly effect? Yeah. Um, just the uh, effect that I went through with Alaska Airlines, <laughs> which is the butterfly effect, right? Uh, yeah. One event leading to another. And uh, in industry, it's also called as a thundering herd effect, where you have this cattle running against you, right? Or running, running in front of you because something triggered an event. Yeah. So that's the butterfly effect. Well said. So. Uh, Again, coming to the definition of the butterfly effect, it's basically a butterfly flying somewhere in the Brazil area. The flutter of the uh, wings of butterfly can lead to catastrophic effects somewhere in the Texas area. So that's a theory. So 
S uh, applying that theory here, uh, typically let's say there is a, a microservice or an application deployed in the Cloud Foundry with microservices here, right? There's a front-ending application called Web App. It has a UI and it has, uh, it depends on service one. And service one in turn is dependent on database and service one is also calling service two and service two in turn is calling third party. No. Now in this case, what, what happens? Whoops. In this case, what happens if the third party application starts behaving? So the service two would not get the response from the third party, right? Now what happens if this what happens to the service one that is dependent on service two, which is in turn dependent on third party? So there is a cascading, there is a timeout that you can clearly see in the service one. And what happens if the database connectivity from service one goes down, right? So all these three put together is going to create an unfavorable behavior at the UI level and in turn is going to create a customer impact or a UI, uh, UI issue at the client side. So, Karun, um, yeah. so just for these scenarios you're talking about specifically, don't we have something like a circuit breaker that can yeah. help you out here? Great, great question. So circuit breaker, you are going to configure circuit breaker. Let's say if it's a Spring application, you can leverage Spring Cloud Service circuit breaker here. And the web application, in order to minimize the UI impact, it can call the circuit breaker and fall back into the other service that this application is configured with. But having said that, what we are trying to say is Monarch is creating a job for the circuit breaker. It is giving you a chance to verify if circuit breaker is working as uh, you know as you have programmed or not right as you have configured or not so that's the uh, you know one one way like you know monarch can give you uh, wings and testing uh, all this kind of uh, latency and also you know uh, the issues within your app for the next demo i'm going to talk about uh, a fortune ui application it's an open source application and backed with a fortune service it's a microservice here and fortune service is backed with mysql database so the fortune service is pulling a random fortune event from mysql database and fortune ui is talking to fortune service to display whatever is the random fortune uh, you know string that is passed to the ui now in this case what happens if the database, if there is a latency that you have introduced into Fortune service and MySQL database, what happens if you have crashed Fortune service, if you're killing the service itself, how is the UI of Fortune UI going to behave? Now, what happens if you're blocking? So there was a latency and now you're blocking the service itself. So Fortune, said Fortune service can no more talk to the MySQL database. In all such scenarios, you have Fortune UI configured with Hystrix circuit breaker. The circuit breaker has to fall back onto uh, you know alternative service in order to ensure that the ui is not impacted in when when these kind of attacks are happening on the dependent or down services so let's uh, get into a, a live demo again another um, so i'm going to show you uh, a web application fortune ui uh, you can see the screen right so, okay. Um, can, can I, can I? Yeah, you the have VPN? to connect yeah, back to the VPN, right? So yeah. while he's connecting back to the VPN, because this part of the demo requires the VPN, I guess I'll be a storyteller until that happens. Um, everybody here has ever been on a fire drill? Not a fire drill, at fire drill where your boss calls you and says, like, get this done, right? Not that. I'm talking about an actual fire drill. Who's been on an actual fire drill at work? Do you guys know why we do it? <coughs> Practice? Why do you think we need practice? Bingo. Yes. So if you think about a fire drill, what's happening is you have a system for which you have a steady state. And there's a known recovery path for that system. And what happens in a fire drill is you're trying to validate the known recovery path. Because when real incident happens, you don't want to fail. right? So the practice drill here is to validate that system's recovery path so you can get all your clients outside the building safely and securely. That's the whole point of a fire drill. That's very much related to the analogy of chaos engineering because you have a system, every system has a known recovery path, you make assumptions, if you don't validate the known recovery paths, you are bound to fail. So, it's the next story I had. Not really a story, but it just came to my mind. Are we done? Do you have another story? I don't have another story, but we'll take a question. Okay, we are lucky. Mm -hmm. When in a controlled environment and when we know we are going to fail things, it's not the actual test. 
Right. So how do you do that? Like, are yeah. you doing that assembly in production? No. So there's a graduation path to everything, just like where you go through your grades to get to high school, to get to college. So you, you don't want to go start off targeting your business critical apps in production and take them down because your CEO or somebody's going to call you and like, WTF again, right? So um, if you think about Netflix's concept of chaos engineering, they were nicely positioned to be that company where they started off these in a lower environment, graduated, and today they run their attacks live in production in Amazon's infrastructure. They take an AZ down, if you don't know. They take an actual AZ down, and you know, know the impact because it's happening during live hours. So there's a graduation path, and that's what the principles of chaos engineering advocate, right? We're nowhere close to that. In fact, we're not even ready to touch our non prod environments because it's production to us. Um, so any team that is trying to go through this graduation path will have to do it in cycles and not just aspire to go big. So right now our focus is a specific set of apps in non-production in a control environment and then taking it further. Because you want to understand the blast radius, you want to make sure the teams that you're interacting with has specific runbooks to know the recovery paths. So. Okay. Can we, can we uh, getting back to the demo here, so we have two applications. Uh, the Fortune service is a microservice and Fortune UI is talking to the Fortune service. And uh, let's look at the services. So I'm using CFCLI and connecting to my org and space. And uh, you have circuit breaker uh, configured or bound to the app Fortune UI here. And Fortune database of type MySQL is bound to Fortune service. And service registry is a service discovery. So all the apps that you have inside this space are bound to this service registry so that they can talk to each other. Now, <clears throat> let me uh, uh, open this UI. So I copy this URL and then I go in here. And you can see here, you have random fortunes, uh, you know, uh, a one-liner strings that keeps uh, uh, showing up here. And uh, it's pretty responsive, like, you know, you don't see any issue here, right? So now let's perform a chaos attack on this application. I like the last one, love yeah. kennel. I don't know if you saw that, but <laughs> it's random. <laughs> So Monarch has been open source, so you need to, uh, it's, a Py it's based on Python, so I need to import the required library. So I need to config uh, a YAML file here, uh, because I need to provide to the Monarch, like, you know, which environment I'm connecting to which Cloud Foundry target I'm connecting to. So we have uh, a, a, a VPN, uh, you know, a foundation in our own environment and uh, I have to connect it via VPN. Mm. Valid argument. Um, you have an YA, is that it? Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah. No, there's an extra. Extra A, Y A M L. Config, uh, so let me go in there. Okay, so we have this now, and then uh, the first thing that we are going to do is we have to di discover where the, for where the fortune service is within the cluster. So all I need to do is provide an org name and the space name and the application name. So app.discover is going to discover where my application is running inside a cluster of 100 virtual machines. 
once I have the app object loaded it takes a couple of seconds to identify where the app app is running <coughs> The first attack that we're going to do while this is running is uh, we are going to block the traffic from fortune service to the um, MySQL you database. <coughs> okay, it's still taking time. It's taking some time to discover? Yeah. Okay, so we got, uh, uh, so the app has been discovered. Now I'm going to block services, fortunes db. So this is a MySQL database that I'm trying to block. Anybody has an idea of what's gonna happen when you block? Yeah. Fall back. So the circuit breaker has been kicked, up, kick, kicked off and then you know you can see your future is unclear. So this is coming from uh, the circuit breaker. So we didn't want it to impact the UI. So some random string is being, it's not random, it's a static string which is your future is not clear, has been programmed by the circuit breaker to show up here. So, so that's what is blocking the service. So we have blocked microservice to the MySQL database. So all we need to do now is like, you know, if we have to roll back, uh, we can uh, unblock services. Take, uh, this is done. So now again, uh, when, when you unblock, you will see that you know everything is back into action. So one thing I want you to note here is uh, the response coming from the Fortune service is pretty quick. Now I'm going to inject a latency into the uh, uh, into the Fortune service. So for that, I'm going to use manipulate traffic. And what do you guys think will happen when you do latency injection? Anybody? Timeout. Time uh, so I've given like 100 milliseconds of latency for now with a standard deviation of 10. So it's basically a 10 percentage of uh, the latency. So it can be 10 plus or minus 10 milliseconds. So when I in inject, when I start initiated this manipulate network, uh, you can see that the it takes time. There's a pause. Yeah, I think I, we can increase the uh, uh, timeout to more. Network. But it's pretty obvious that it's taking time. Yeah. yeah. So you have to unmanipulate before you can actually target yeah, so a new attack. Yeah. Right? So that's the improvement that we are trying to make again. So let's introduce. Let's inject like 400 milliseconds of latency to the same app. Yeah, so this is running now. You can see there's a brief pause. So there is a timeout and the service registry picked it up and sometimes like, you know, there's no timeout. So you can see like, you know, there's a brief pause about 400 milliseconds uh, for the message to come up. So now I'm gonna unmanipulate and then uh, finally do one, perform one more test, which is crashing the app instance, which is fortune service here. So for that, um, I'm Any going ideas to what's gonna happen here? when you crash the instance? Karun hinted about it earlier when he did a similar attack. Correct. That's the beauty of Cloud Foundry, so, self-healing. Yeah. So when you crash this instance, the Cloud Foundry will bring back a new instance in its place, but uh, you, can, you can also check CF events on uh, Fortune iPhone service. On the left side, you can see uh, the crash events pretty much clear here. And then um, bef you can see uh, the circuit breaker is coming into action again. And after a few minutes, a few seconds, like you know, once the app is back, we can check the instance count of the Fortune service now, because Cloud Foundry would have brought back a new app instance in its place. So you've got one out of one to maintain the desired state. Okay, so it started working again. So that's, these are some of the attacks that you can perform on 
your any target application so let's uh, move on to That's what we did. We, we we just saw like you know how to block a service, how to introduce latency, and how historic circuit breaker will play a role. So some of the limitations and improvements and future enhancements that we are planning is Monarch right now can attack one cluster at a time. So imagine you have applications deployed in multi foundation. So you have multiple clusters and you have application uh, uh, spread across multiple clusters. So Monarch at any point of time can only attack one application in one cluster. So that's uh, a particular limitation that we are trying to overcome and we wanted to make uh, some more enhancements in that and improvement areas and turbulence plus plus and monarch are two different applications or two different toolkits right now for performing infrastructure and the application so there is a possibility of merge into one solution uh, most likely that is going to happen in next uh, version of monarch and uh, there are evolving design patterns like Istio and Envoy. So there is uh, so Envoy, which is a sidecar container to uh, to every application instance, uh, can also have this kind of injection attacks uh, that you can program, and which can also perform simulation tests, like you know uh, what Monarch is doing today. So we wanted to see like you know how we can converge the efforts that we are putting in Monarch, and uh, how the Envoy can be leveraged, uh, or is there any possibility of these two working together? going forward so those are three things that uh, we wanted to work on do you want to talk about game days oh sure um, let me take the mic. so we're towards the end here um, anybody heard about game days here so yeah game days is essentially an industry standard for anybody doing chaos engineering where you get your teams together and you run targeted attacks in a confined environment um, and you validate your run books, right? So we're trying to share game days for our app teams. In fact, we completed our first game day with a team that does coverage maps. There, if you're a customer of T-Mobile, there is the personal coverage checker where you can see the T-Mobile coverage. Um, and we did an attack on their applications, running in NPE, non-prod environment, not with prod. Like I mentioned again, you've got to start off in a smaller environment, right? So um, forging ahead, six months ago when we did our first talk in chaos engineering we were exploring the capabilities and tools uh, here we are today where we're actually doing game days and we want to continue in this momentum of running more game days with our app teams so if everything holds together you'll see us back at spring one to talk about our advancements with chaos engineering so 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 uh, this is the last slide so just to come sum up like you know uh, clearly we are moving from uh, the analogy of joker here wherein he says chaos is fair in 2008 to what is it today in Game of Thrones where the later says chaos isn't a pit, chaos is a ladder. So every person wants to go up the ladder but still they falter or pe some people do not want to grow up the ladder. That's because they are still accustomed with the root rooted, uh, it's so rooted that they wanted to stick to uh, their own beliefs or some kind of uh, you know a belief in the god that you know everything would work so well so what we are trying to say is make sure that you know chaos is you want to you have to decide whether you want to stay in a pit or you want to grow up the ladder so that's where uh, this thing comes in yeah nicely said yeah. Uh, so before we wrap up nine o'clock tomorrow keynote we'll be back on stage there is another exciting demo which won't be a live demo because it's keynote <laughs> we want to play it safe with the keynote no validate our recovery pattern right so we are just going to like do a recorded demo but um, similar content but in a more condensed version nicer format than this i won't say this is not nice but you know something new at nine o'clock it's only a 10 minute talk so i encourage everybody to come there cheer for us thank you <laughs> questions we can take questions yes <coughs> No. Lineage to and fault no, injection. Really not. I'm curious what it is. <laughs> what are the questions do we have? Go ahead, sir. Yeah, so, uh, I guess in, in one way to look at this, the type of chaos engineering that you've introduced is just kind of network based. Uh, as we know, failures can happen in any place within the code. Have you guys thought about <laughs> introducing like exceptions? 
Sure. Uh, the Monarch is, uh, I think we have uh, scoped it already in the next release where we wanted to inject a security configuration uh, into the app level. So when for a given runtime application, we wanted to inject a specific configuration and see how your application behaves. Yeah, this is pretty much there. <coughs> Anybody else? Questions? Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you.